Rocky's formidable aunt wants to experience New York through her nephew. But Rocky hates New York. Maybe Jeeves can help. P.G. Woodhouse, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episode for the week is Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. Be sure to check it out on Tuesday. If the show has helped alleviate your stress, if it's given you comfort, or if you've been able to discover beloved authors and stories you might have missed on your own, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. Help us to help other folks like you please go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter for as little as $5 a month. As a thank you gesture, we'll send you a coupon code every month for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. Thanks for helping us out. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today. And now, The Ant and the Sluggard by P.G. Woodhouse. Now that it's all over, I may as well admit that there was a time during the rather funny affair of Rock Metler Todd when I thought that Jeeves was going to let me down. The man had the appearance of being baffled. Jeeves is my man, you know. Officially, he puts in his weekly wages for pressing my clothes and all that sort of thing. But actually, he's more like what the poet Johnny called some bird of his acquaintance who was apt to rally round him in times of need. A guide, don't you know? Philosopher if I remember rightly, and I rather fancy friend. I rely on him at every turn. So, naturally, when Rocky Todd told me about his aunt, I didn't hesitate. Jeeves was in on the thing from the start. The affair of Rocky Todd broke loose early one morning of spring. I was in bed, restoring the good old tissues with about nine hours of the dreamless, when the door flew open and somebody prodded me in the lower ribs and began to shake the bedclothes. After blinking a bit and generally pulling myself together, I located Rocky. My first impression was that it was some horrid dream. Rocky, you see, lived down on Long Island somewhere, miles away from New York. And not only that, but he had told me himself more than once that he never got up before twelve, and seldom earlier than one. Constitutionally the laziest young devil in America, he had hit on a walk in life which enabled him to go the limit in that direction, he was a poet. At least he wrote poems when he did anything. But most of his time, as far as I could make out, he spent in a sort of trance. He told me once that he could sit on a fence watching a worm and wondering what on earth it was up to for hours at a stretch. He had his scheme of life worked out to a fine point. About once a month he would take three days writing a few poems. The other 329 days of the year he rested. I didn't know there was enough money in poetry to support a chappy, even in the way in which Rocky lived. But it seems that if you stick to exhortations to young men to lead the strenuous life, and don't shove in any rhymes, American editors fight for the stuff. Rocky showed me one of his things once. It began, B, B, the past is dead, tomorrow is not born, B today, today, B with every nerve, with every muscle, with every drop of your red blood, B. It was printed opposite the frontispiece of a magazine, with a sort of scroll round it, and a picture in the middle of a fairly nude chappy, with bulging muscles, giving the rising sun the glad eye. Rocky said they gave him a hundred dollars for it, and he stayed in bed till four in the afternoon for over a month. As regarded the future, he was pretty solid, owing to the fact that that he had a moneyed aunt tucked away somewhere in Illinois, and as he had been named Rock Mettler after her, and was her only nephew, his position was pretty sound. He told me that when he did come into the money, he meant to do no work at all, except perhaps an occasional poem, 
recommending the young man with life opening out before him, with all its splendid possibilities, to light a pipe and shove his feet upon the mantelpiece. And this was the man who was prodding me in the ribs in the grey dawn. Read this, Bertie. I could just see that he was waving a letter or something equally foul in my face. Wake up and read this. I can't read before I've had my morning tea and a cigarette. I groped for the bell. Jeeves came in looking as fresh as a dewy violet. It's a mystery to me how he does it. Tea, Jeeves? Very good, sir. He flowed silently out of the room. He always gives you the impression of being some liquid substance when he moves, and I found that Rocky was surging round with his beastly letter again. What is it? I said. What on earth's the matter? Read it! I can't. I haven't had my tea. Well, listen then. Who's it from? My aunt. At this point I fell asleep again. I awoke to hear him saying, So, what on earth am I going to do? Jeeves trickled in with the tray, like some silent stream meandering over its mossy bed, and I saw daylight. Read it again, Rocky old top, I said. I want Jeeves to hear it. Mr. Todd's aunt has written him a rather rummy letter, Jeeves, and we want your advice. Very good, sir. He stood in the middle of the room, registering devotion to the cause, and Rocky started again. My dear Rock Mettler, I have been thinking things over for a long while, and I have come to the conclusion that I have been very thoughtless to wait long before doing what I have made up my mind to do now. What do you make of that, Jeeves? It seems a little obscure at present, sir, but no doubt it becomes clearer at a later point in the communication. It becomes clear as mud, said Rocky. Proceed, old scout, I said, champing my bread and butter. You know how all my life I have longed to visit New York and see for myself the wonderful gay life of which I have read so much. I fear that now it will be impossible for me to fulfill my dream. I am old and worn out. I seem to have no strength left in me. Sad, Jeeves, what? Extremely, sir. Said nothing, said Rocky. It's sheer laziness. I went to see her last Christmas, and she was bursting with health. Her doctor told me himself that there was nothing wrong with her or whatever, but she will insist that she's a hopeless invalid. So he has to agree with her. She's got a fixed idea that the trip to New York would kill her. So, though it's been her ambition all her life to come here, she stays where she is. Rather like that chappy whose heart was in the highlands are chasing the deer, Jeeves. The cases are in some respects parallel, sir. Carry on, Rocky, dear boy. So I have decided that if I cannot enjoy all the marvels of the city myself, I can at least enjoy them through you. I suddenly thought of this yesterday after reading a beautiful poem in the Sunday paper about a young man who had longed all his life for a certain thing and won it in the end, only when he was too old to enjoy it. It was very sad, and it touched me. The thing, interpolated Rocky, bitterly, that I've not been able to do in ten years. As you know, you will have my money when I am gone, but until now I have never been able to see my way to giving you an allowance. I have now decided to do so, on one condition— I have written to a firm of lawyers in New York, giving them instructions to pay you quite a substantial sum each month. My one condition is that you live in New York and enjoy yourself as I have always wished to do. I want you to be my representative, to spend this money for me as I should do myself. I want you to plunge into the gay, prismatic life of New York. I want you to be the life and soul of brilliant supper parties. Above all, I want you, indeed I insist on this, to write me letters at least once a week, giving me a full description of all you are doing and all that is going on in the city, so that I may enjoy at second hand what my wretched health prevents me enjoying for myself. Remember that I shall expect full details, and that no detail is too trivial to interest. Your affectionate aunt, Isabel Rockmettler. What about it? said Rocky. What about it? I said. Yes. What on earth am I going to do? 
It was only then that I really got on to the extremely rummy attitude of this chappie, in view of the fact that a quite unexpected mess of the right stuff had suddenly descended on him from a blue sky. To my mind, it was an occasion for the beaming smile and the joyous whoop. Yet here the man was, looking and talking as if fate had swung on his solar plexus. It amazed me. Aren't you bucked? I said. Bucked? If I were in your place, I should be frightfully braced. I consider this pretty soft for you. He gave a kind of yelp, stared at me for a moment, and then began to talk of New York in a way that reminded me of Jimmy Mundy, the reformer chappie. Jimmy had just come to New York on a hit-the-trail campaign, and I had popped in at the garden a couple of days before, for half an hour or so, to hear him. He had certainly told New York some pretty straight things about itself, having apparently taken a dislike to the place. But by Jove, you know, dear old Rocky made him look like a publicity agent for the old metrop. Pretty soft, he cried, to have to come and live in New York, to have to leave my little cottage and take a stuffy, smelly, overheated hole of an apartment in this heaven-forsaken, festering Gehenna, to have to mix night after night with a mob who think that life is a sort of St. Vitus's dance and imagine that they're having a good time because they're making enough noise for six and drinking too much for ten. I loathe New York, Bertie. I wouldn't come near the place if I hadn't got to see editors occasionally. There's a blight on it. It's got moral delirium tremens. It's the limit. The very thought of staying more than a day in it makes me sick. And you call this thing pretty soft for me? I felt rather like Lot's friends must have done when they dropped in for a quiet chat and their genial host began to criticize the cities of the plain. I had no idea old Rocky could be so eloquent. It would kill me to have to live in New York, he went on to have to share the air with six million people, to have to wear stiff collars and decent clothes all the time, to... He started. Good Lord, I suppose I should have to dress for dinner in the evenings. What a ghastly notion! I was shocked, absolutely shocked. My dear chap, I said reproachfully, do you dress for dinner every night, Bertie? Jeeves, I said coldly, the man was still standing like a statue by the door. How many suits of evening clothes have I? We have three suits full of evening dress, sir. Two dinner jackets. Three. For practical purposes, two only, sir. If you remember, we cannot wear the third. We also have seven white waistcoats. And shirts? Four dozen, sir. And white ties? The first two shallow shelves in the chest of drawers are completely filled with our white ties, sir. I turned to Rocky. You see? The chappy writhed like an electric fan. I won't do it. I can't do it. I'll be hanged if I'll do it. How on earth can I dress up like that? Do you realize that most days I don't get out of my pajamas till five in the afternoon, and then I just put on an old sweater? I saw Jeeves wince, poor chap. This sort of revelation shocked his finest feelings. Then what are you going to do about it? I said. That's what I want to know. You might write and explain to your aunt. I might, if I wanted her to get round to her lawyers in two rapid leaps and cut me out of her will. I saw his point. What do you suggest, Jeeves? I said. Jeeves cleared his throat respectfully. The crux of the matter would appear to be, sir, that Mr. Todd is obliged by the conditions under which the money is delivered into his possession— to write Miss Rockmettler long and detailed letters relating to his movements, and the only method by which this can be accomplished, if Mr. Todd adheres to his expressed intention of remaining in the country, is for Mr. Todd to induce some second party to gather the actual experiences which Miss Rockmettler wishes reported to her, and to convey these to him in the shape of a careful report, on which it would be possible for him with the aid of his imagination, to base the suggested correspondence. Having got which off the old diaphragm, Jeeves was silent. Rocky looked at me in a helpless sort of way. 
He hasn't been brought up on Jeeves as I have, and he isn't on to his curves. Could he put it a little clearer, Bertie? He said. I thought at the start it was going to make sense, but it kind of flickered. What's the idea? My dear old man, perfectly simple. I knew we could stand on Jeeves. All you've got to do is to get somebody to go round the town for you and take a few notes, and then you work the notes up into letters. That's it, isn't it, Jeeves? Precisely, sir. The light of hope gleamed in Rocky's eyes. He looked at Jeeves in a startled way, dazed by the man's vast intellect. But who would do it? he said. It would have to be a pretty smart sort of man, a man who would notice things. Jeeves, I said. Let Jeeves do it. But would he? You would do it, wouldn't you, Jeeves? For the first time in our long connection, I observed Jeeves almost smile. The corner of his mouth curved quite a quarter of an inch, and for a moment his eye ceased to look like a meditative fish's. I should be delighted to oblige, sir. As a matter of fact, I have already visited some of New York's places of interest on my evening out, and it would be most enjoyable to make a practice of the pursuit. Fine. I know exactly what your aunt wants to hear about, Rocky. She wants an earful of cabaret stuff. The place you ought to go first, Jeeves, is Rigelheimer's. It's on 42nd Street. Anybody will show you the way. Jeeves shook his head. Pardon me, sir. People are no longer going to Rigelheimer's. The place at the moment is Frolics on the Roof. You see, I said to Rocky, leave it to Jeeves. He knows. It isn't often that you find an entire group of your fellow humans happy in this world, but our little circle was certainly an example of the fact that it can be done. We were all full of beans. Everything went absolutely right from the start. Jeeves was happy, partly because he loves to exercise his giant brain, and partly because he was having a corking time among the bright lights. I saw him one night at the midnight revels. He was sitting at a table on the edge of the dancing floor, doing himself remarkably well with a fat cigar and a bottle of the best. I'd never imagined he could look so nearly human. His face wore an expression of austere benevolence, and he was making notes in a small book. As for the rest of us, I was feeling pretty good, because I was fond of old Rocky, and glad to be able to do him a good turn. Rocky was perfectly contented, because he was still able to sit on fences in his pyjamas and watch worms. And, as for the aunt, she seemed tickled to death. She was getting Broadway at pretty long range, but it seemed to be hitting her just right. I read one of her letters to Rocky, and it was full of life. But then, Rocky's letters, based on Jeeves's notes, were enough to buck anybody up. It was rummy when he came to think of it. There was I, loving the life, while the mere mention of it gave Rocky a tired feeling. Yet, here is a letter I wrote to a pal of mine in London. Dear Freddy, Well, here I am in New York. It's not a bad place. I'm not having a bad time. Everything's pretty all right. The cabarets aren't bad. Don't know when I shall be back. How's everybody? Chiro, yours, Bertie. P.S. Seen old Ted lately? Not that I cared about Ted, but if I hadn't dragged him in, I couldn't have got the confounded thing on to the second page. Now, here's old Rocky on exactly the same subject. Dearest Aunt Isabel, how can I ever thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to live in this astounding city? New York seems more wonderful every day. Fifth Avenue is at its best, of course, just now. The dresses are magnificent. Wads of stuff about the dresses. I didn't know Jeeves was such an authority. I was out with some of the crowd at the midnight revels the other night. We took in a show first, after a little dinner at a new place on 43rd Street. We were quite a gay party. Georgie Cohan looked in about midnight and got off a good one about Willie Collier. Fred Stone could only stay a minute, but Doug Fairbanks did all sorts of stunts and made us roar. Diamond Jim Brady was there, as usual, and Lorette Taylor showed up with a party. The show at the Revels is quite good. I am enclosing a program. Last night a few of us went round to Frolics on the Roof. And so on and so forth. Yards of it. I suppose it's the artistic temperament or something. What I mean is, 
It's easier for a chappy who's used to writing poems and that sort of tosh to put a bit of a punch into a letter than it is for a chappy like me. Anyway, there's no doubt that Rocky's correspondence was hot stuff. I called Jeeves in and congratulated him. Jeeves, you're a wonder. Thank you, sir. How you notice everything in these places beats me. I couldn't tell you a thing about them, except that I've had a good time. It's just a knack, sir. Well, Mr. Todd's letters ought to brace Miss Rockmetal all right, what? Undoubtedly, sir, agreed Jeeves. And by Jove, they did. They certainly did, by George. What I mean to say is, I was sitting in the apartment one afternoon, about a month after the thing had started, smoking a cigarette and resting the old bean, when the door opened, and the voice of Jeeves burst the silence like a bomb. It wasn't that he spoke loudly. He has one of those soft, soothing voices that slide through the atmosphere like the note of a far-off sheep. It was what he said that made me leap like a young gazelle. Miss Rockmettler. And in came a large, solid female. The situation floored me. I'm not denying it. Hamlet must have felt much as I did when his father's ghost bobbed up in the fairway. I'd come to look on Rocky's aunt as such a permanency in her own home that it didn't seem possible that she could really be here in New York. I stared at her. Then I looked at Jeeves. He was standing there in an attitude of dignified detachment, the chump, when, if ever he should have been rallying round the young master, it was now. Rocky's aunt looked less like an invalid than any one I've ever seen, except my Aunt Agatha. She had a good deal of Aunt Agatha about her, as a matter of fact. She looked as if she might be deucedly dangerous if put upon, and something seemed to tell me that she would certainly regard herself as put upon if she ever found out the game which poor old Rocky had been pulling on her. "'Good afternoon,' I managed to say. "'How do you do?' she said. "'Mr. Cohan? Uh, no. Mr. Fred Stone? Not absolutely. As a matter of fact, my name's Worcester. Bertie Worcester.' She seemed disappointed. The fine old name of Worcester— appeared to mean nothing in her life. "'Isn't Rockmettler home?' she said. "'Where is he?' She had me with the first shot. I couldn't think of anything to say. I couldn't tell her that Rocky was down in the country, watching worms. There was the faintest flutter of sound in the background. It was the respectful cough with which Jeeves announces that he is about to speak without having been spoken to. "'If you remember, sir.' Mr. Todd went out in the automobile with a party in the afternoon. So he did, Jeeves, so he did, I said, looking at my watch. Did he say when he would be back? He gave me to understand, sir, that he would be somewhat late in returning. He vanished, and the aunt took the chair which I'd forgotten to offer her. She looked at me in rather a rummy way. It was a nasty look. It made me feel as if I was something the dog had brought in, and intended to bury later on, when he had time. My own Aunt Agatha, back in England, has looked at me in exactly the same way many a time, and it never fails to make my spine curl. You seem very much at home here, young man. Are you a great friend of Rock Metler's? Oh, yes, rather. She frowned as if she had expected better things of old Rocky. Well, you need to be, she said the way you treat his flat as your own. I give you my word, this quite unforeseen slam simply robbed me of the power of speech. I'd been looking on myself in the light of the dashing host, and suddenly to be treated as an intruder jarred me. It wasn't, mark you, as if she had spoken in a way to suggest that she considered my presence in the place as an ordinary social call. She obviously looked on me as a cross between a burglar and the plumber's man come to fix the leak in the bathroom. It hurt her, my being there. At this juncture, with the conversation showing every sign of being about to die in awful agonies, an idea came to me. Tea. The good old standby. Would you care for a cup of tea? I said. Tea? She spoke as if she had never heard of the stuff. Nothing like a cup of tea after a journey, I said. Bucks you up puts a bit of the zip into you. What I mean is, restores you and so on, don't you know? I'll go and tell Jeeves. I tottered down the passage to Jeeves's lair. The man was reading the evening paper as if he hadn't a care in the world. Jeeves, I said, 
We want some tea. Very good, sir. I say, Jeeves, this is a bit thick, what? I wanted sympathy, don't you know? Sympathy and kindness. The old nerve centres had had the deuce of a shock. She's got the idea this place belongs to Mr. Todd. What on earth put that into her head? Jeeves filled the kettle with a restrained dignity. No doubt because of Mr. Todd's letters, sir, he said. It was my suggestion, sir, if you remember, that they should be addressed from this apartment, in order that Mr. Todd should appear to possess a good central residence in the city. I remembered. We had thought it a brainy scheme at the time. Well, it's bally awkward, you know, Jeeves. She looks on me as an intruder. By Jove, I suppose she thinks I'm someone who hangs about her, touching Mr. Todd for free meals and borrowing his shirts. Yes, sir. It's pretty rotten, you know. Most disturbing, sir. And there's another thing. What are we to do about Mr. Todd? We've got to get him up here as soon as ever we can. When you have brought the tea, you had better go out and send him a telegram, telling him to come up by the next train. I have already done so, sir. I took the liberty of writing the message and dispatching it by the lift attendant. By Jove! You think of everything, Jeeves. Thank you, sir. A little buttered toast with the tea? Just so, sir. Thank you. I went back to the sitting room. She hadn't moved an inch. She was still bolt upright on the edge of her chair, gripping her umbrella like a hammer thrower. She gave me another of those looks as I came in. There was no doubt about it. For some reason she had taken a dislike to me. I suppose because I wasn't George M. Cohan. It was a bit hard on a chap. This is a surprise, what? I said, after about five minutes' restful silence, trying to crank the conversation up again. What is a surprise? You're coming here, don't you know, and so on. She raised her eyebrows and drank me in a bit more through her glasses. Why is it surprising that I should visit my only nephew? She said. Put like that, of course, it did seem reasonable. Or rather, I said, of course, certainly. What I mean is... Jeeves projected himself into the room with the tea. I was jolly glad to see him. There's nothing like having a bit of business arranged for one when one isn't certain of one's lines. With the teapot to fool about with, I felt happier. Tea, 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 what, what? I said. It wasn't what I had meant to say. My idea had been to be a good deal more formal and so on. Still, it covered the situation. I poured her out a cup. She sipped it and put the cup down with a shudder. "'Do you mean to say, young man,' she said frostily, "'that you expect me to drink this stuff?' "'Rather, bucks you up, you know.' "'What do you mean by the expression, bucks you up?' "'Well, it makes you full of beans, you know. Makes you fizz.' "'I don't understand a word you say. You're English, aren't you?' I admitted it. She didn't say a word and somehow she did it in a way that made it worse than if she had spoken for hours. Somehow it was brought home to me that she didn't like Englishmen, and if she had to meet an Englishman, I was the one she'd have chosen last. Conversation languished again after that. Then I tried again. I was becoming more convinced every moment that you can't make a real lively salon with a couple of people, especially if one of them lets it go a word at a time. "'Are you comfortable at your hotel?' I said. "'At which hotel?' "'The hotel you're staying at.' "'I am not staying at an hotel.' "'Stopping with friends, what?' "'I am naturally stopping with my nephew.' "'I didn't get it for the moment. "'Then it hit me. "'What? Here?' I gurgled. "'Certainly. Where else should I go?' "'The full horror of the situation rolled over me like a wave.' I couldn't see what on earth I was to do. I couldn't explain that this wasn't Rocky's flat without giving the poor old chap away hopelessly, because she would then ask me where he did live, and then he would be right in the soup. I was trying to induce the old bean to recover from the shock and produce some results when she spoke again. Will you kindly tell my nephew's manservant to prepare my room? I wish to lie down. Your nephew's manservant? the man you call Jeeves. If Rock Mettler has gone for an automobile ride, there is no need for you to wait for him. He will naturally wish to be alone with me when he returns. I found myself 
tottering out of the room. The thing was too much for me. I crept into Jeeves's den. Jeeves, I whispered. Sir, mix me a B and S, Jeeves. I feel weak. Very good, sir. This is getting thicker every minute, Jeeves. Sir. She thinks you're Mr. Todd's man. She thinks the whole place is his and everything in it. I don't see what you ought to do except stay on and keep it up. I can't say anything, or she'll get on to the whole thing, and I don't want to let Mr. Todd down. By the way, Jeeves, she wants you to prepare her bed. He looked wounded. It's hardly my place, sir. I know, I know. But do it as a personal favour to me. If you come to that, it's hardly my place to be flung out of the flat like this and have to go to an hotel, what? Is it your intention to go to an hotel, sir? What will you do for your clothes? Good Lord, I hadn't thought of that. Can you put a few things in a bag when she isn't looking and sneak them down to me at the Centauria? I will endeavour to do so, sir. Well, I don't think there's anything more, is there? Tell Mr. Todd where I am when he gets here. Very good, sir. I looked round the place. The moment of parting had come. I felt sad. The whole thing reminded me of one of those melodramas where they drive chappies out of the old homestead into the snow. Goodbye, Jeeves, I said. Goodbye, sir. I staggered out. You know, I rather think I agree with those poet and philosopher Johnnies who insist that a fellow ought to be devilish pleased if he has a bit of trouble. All that stuff about being refined by suffering, you know. Suffering does give a chap a sort of broader and more sympathetic outlook. It helps you understand other people's misfortunes if you've been through the same thing yourself. As I stood in my lonely bedroom at the hotel, trying to tie my white tie myself, it struck me for the first time that there must be whole squads of chappies in the world who had to get along without a man to look after them. I'd always thought of Jeeves as a kind of natural phenomenon. But by Jove, of course, when you come to think of it, there must be quite a lot of fellows who have to press their own clothes themselves and haven't got anybody to bring them tea in the morning and so on. It was rather a solemn thought, don't you know? I mean to say, ever since then, I've been able to appreciate the frightful privations the poor have to stick. I got dressed, somehow. Jeeves hadn't forgotten a thing in his packing. Everything was there, down to the final stud. I'm not sure this didn't make me feel worse. It kind of deepened the pathos. It was like what somebody or other wrote about the touch of a vanished hand. I had a bit of dinner somewhere, and went to a show of some kind, but nothing seemed to make any difference. I simply hadn't the heart to go on to supper anywhere. I just sucked down a whiskey and soda in the hotel's smoking room, and went straight up to bed. I don't know when I felt so rotten. Somehow, I found myself moving about the room softly as if there had been a death in the family. If I had anybody to talk to, I should have talked in a whisper. In fact, when the telephone bell rang, I answered in such a sad, hushed voice that the fellow on the other end of the wire said, Hello! five times, thinking he hadn't got me. It was rocky. The poor old scout was deeply agitated. Bertie? Is that you, Bertie? Oh, gosh, I'm having a time. Where are you speaking from? The Midnight Revels. I've been here about an hour, and I think we're a fixture for the night. I've told Aunt Isabel I've gone out to call up a friend to join us. She's glued to a chair, with This is the Life written all over her, taking it in through the pores. She loves it, and I'm nearly crazy. Tell me all, old top, I said. A little more of this, he said, and I shall sneak quietly off to the river and end it all. Do you mean to say you go through this sort of thing every night, Bertie, and enjoy it? It's simply infernal. I was just snatching a wink of sleep behind the bill of fare just now, when about a million yelling girls swooped down with toy balloons. There are two orchestras here, each trying to see if it can't play louder than the other. I'm a mental and physical wreck. When your telegram arrived, I was just lying down for a quiet pipe, with a sense of absolute peace stealing over me. I had to get dressed and sprint two miles to catch the train. It nearly gave me heart failure. And on top of that, I almost got brain fever inventing lies to tell Aunt Isabel. 
and then I had to cram myself into these confounded evening clothes of yours. I gave a sharp wail of agony. It hadn't struck me till then that Rocky was depending on my wardrobe to see him through. You'll ruin them. I hope so, said Rocky, in the most unpleasant way. His trouble seemed to have had the worst effect on his character. I should like to get back at them somehow. They've given me a bad enough time. They're about three sizes too small, and something's apt to give at any moment. I wish to goodness it would, and give me a chance to breathe. I haven't breathed since half past seven. Thank heaven Jeeves managed to get out and buy me a collar that fitted, or I should be a strangled corpse by now. It was touch and go till the stud broke. Bertie, this is pure Hades. Aunt Isabel keeps urging me to dance. How on earth can I dance when I don't know a soul to dance with? And how the deuce could I, even if I knew every girl in the place? It's taking big chances even to move in these trousers. I had to tell her I've hurt my ankle. She keeps asking me when Cohan and Stone are going to show up, and it's simply a question of time before she discovers that Stone is sitting two tables away. Something's got to be done, Bertie. You've got to think up some way of getting me out of this mess. It was you who got me into it. Me? What do you mean? Well, Jeeves, then. It's all the same. It was you who suggested leaving it to Jeeves. It was those letters I wrote from his notes that did the mischief. I made them too good. My aunt's just been telling me about it. She says she had resigned herself to ending her life where she was. And then my letters began to arrive, describing the joys of New York and they stimulated her to such an extent that she pulled herself together and made the trip. She seems to think that she has some miraculous kind of faith cure. I tell you, I can't stand it, Bertie. It's got to end. Can't Jeeves think of anything? No. He just hangs around saying, Most disturbing, sir. A fat lot of help, that is. Well, old lad, I said. After all, it's far worse for me than it is for you. You've got a comfortable home and Jeeves, and you're saving a lot of money. Saving money? What do you mean, saving money? Well, the allowance your aunt is giving you. I suppose she's paying all the expenses now, isn't she? Certainly she is. But she stopped the allowance. She wrote the lawyers tonight. She says that now she's in New York, there is no necessity for it to go on, as we shall always be together. And it's simpler for her to look after that end of it, I tell you, Bertie, I've examined the darn cloud with a microscope, and if it's got a silver lining, it's some little dissembler. But, Rocky, old top, it's too bally awful. You've no notion of what I'm going through in this beastly hotel without Jeeves. I must get back to the flat. Don't come near the flat. But it's my own flat. I can't help that. Aunt Isabel doesn't like you. She asked me what you did for a living. And when I told her you didn't do anything... She said she thought as much, and that you were a typical specimen of a useless and decaying aristocracy. So if you think you have made a hit, forget it. Now I must be going back, or she'll be coming out here after me. Goodbye. Next morning Jeeves came round. He was all so homelike when he floated noiselessly into the room that I nearly broke down. Good morning, sir, he said. I have brought a few more of your personal belongings. He began to unstrap the suitcase he was carrying. Did you have any trouble sneaking them away? It was not easy, sir. I had to watch my chance. Miss Rockmettler is a remarkably alert lady. You know, Jeeves, say what you like. This is a bit thick, isn't it? The situation is certainly one that has never before come under my notice, sir. I have brought the heather mixture suit as the climactic conditions are congenial. Tomorrow, if not prevented, I will endeavour to add the brown lounge with the faint green twill. I can't go on, this sort of thing. Jeeves? We must hope for the best, sir. Can't you think of anything to do? I have been giving the matter considerable thought, sir, but so far without success. I am placing three silk shirts, the dove-coloured, the light blue and the mauve, in the first long drawer, sir. You don't mean to say you can't think of anything, Jeeves? For the moment, sir, no. You will find a dozen handkerchiefs and the tan socks in the upper drawer on the left. He strapped the suitcase and put it on a chair. 
A curious lady, Miss Rockmettler, sir. You understate, Jeeves. He gazed meditatively out of the window. In many ways, sir, Miss Rockmettler reminds me of an aunt of mine, who resides in the southeast portion of London. Their temperaments are much alike. My aunt has the same taste for the pleasures of the great city. It is a passion with her to ride in handsome cabs, sir. Whenever the family take their eyes off her, she escapes from the house and spends the day riding about in cabs. On several occasions, she has broken into the children's savings bank to secure the means to enable her to gratify this desire. I love to have these little chats with you about your female relatives, Jeeves, I said coldly, for I felt that the man had let me down, and I was fed up with him. But I don't see what all this has got to do with my trouble. I beg your pardon, sir. I am leaving the small assortment of neckties on the mantelpiece, sir, for you to select according to your preference. I should recommend the blue with the red domino pattern, sir. Then he streamed imperceptibly toward the door and flowed silently out. I have often heard that chappies, after some great shock or loss, have a habit, after they have been on the floor for a while, wondering what hit them, of picking themselves up and piecing themselves together, and sort of taking a whirl at beginning a new life. Time, the great healer, and nature adjusting itself, and so on and so forth. There's a lot in it, I know, because in my own case, after a day or two of what you might call prostration, I began to recover. The frightful loss of Jeeves made any thought of pleasure more or less a mockery, but at least I found I was able to have a dash at enjoying life again. What I mean is, I was braced up to the extent of going round to cabarets once more, so as to try to forget if only for the moment. New York's a small place, when it comes to the part of it that wakes up, just as the rest is going to bed, and it wasn't long before my tracks began to cross old Rockies. I saw him once at Peel's, and again at Frolic's on the roof. There wasn't anybody with him either time except the aunt, and though he was trying to look as if he had struck the ideal life, it wasn't difficult for me, knowing the circumstances, to see that beneath the mask the poor chap was suffering. My heart bled for the fellow, at least what there was of it that wasn't bleeding for myself bled for him. He had the air of one who was about to crack under the strain. It seemed to me that the aunt was looking slightly upset also. I took it that she was beginning to wonder when the celebrities were going to surge round, and what had suddenly become of all those wild, careless spirits Rocky used to mix with in his letters. I didn't blame her. I'd only read a couple of his letters, but they certainly gave the impression that poor old Rocky was by way of being the hub of New York nightlife, and that, if by any chance he failed to show up at a cabaret, the management said, what's the use, and put up the shutters. The next two nights I didn't come across them, but the night after that I was sitting by myself at the Maison Pierre when somebody tapped me on the shoulder blade, and I found Rocky standing beside me, with a sort of mixed expression of wistfulness and apoplexy on his face. How the chappie had contrived to wear my evening clothes so many times without disaster was a mystery to me. He confided later that early in the proceedings he had slit the waistcoat up the back, and that that had helped a bit. For the moment I had the idea that he had managed to get away from his aunt for the evening, but, looking past him, I saw that she was in again. She was at a table over by the wall, looking at me as if I were something the management ought to be complained to about. Bertie, old scout, said Rocky, in a quiet sort of crushed voice. We've always been pals, haven't we? I mean, you know I'd do you a good turn if you ask me. My dear old lad, I said, the man had moved me. Then, for heaven's sake, come over and sit at our table for the rest of the evening. Well, you know, there are limits to the sacred claims of friendship. My dear old chap, I said, you know I do anything in reason, but you must come, Bertie, you've got to. Something's got to be done to divert her mind. She's brooding about something. She's been like that for the last two days. I think she's beginning to suspect. She can't understand why we never seem to meet anyone I know at these joints. A few nights ago, I happened to run into two newspaper men I used to know fairly well. That kept me going for a while. 
I introduced them to Aunt Isabel as David Belasco and Jim Corbett, and it went well. But the effect is worn off now, and she's beginning to wonder again. Something's got to be done, or she will find out everything. And if she does, I'd take a nickel for my chance of getting a cent from her later on. So for the love of Mike, come across to our table and help things along. I went along. One has to rally round a pal in distress. Aunt Isabel was sitting bolt upright as usual. It certainly did seem as if she had lost a bit of the zest with which she had started out to explore Broadway. She looked as if she had been thinking a good deal about rather unpleasant things. You've met Bertie Worcester, Aunt Isabel, said Rocky. I have. There was something in her eye that seemed to say, Out of a city of six million people, why did you pick on me? Take a seat, Bertie. What'll you have? said Rocky. And so the merry party began. It was one of those jolly, happy, bread-crumbling parties where you cough twice before you speak, and then decide not to say it after all. After we had had an hour of this wild dissipation, Aunt Isabel said she wanted to go home. In the light of what Rocky had been telling me, this struck me as sinister. I had gathered that at the beginning of her visit, she had had to be dragged home with ropes. It must have hit Rocky the same way, for he gave me a pleading look. "'You'll come along, won't you, Bertie, and have a drink at the flat?' I had a feeling that this wasn't in the contract, but there wasn't anything to be done. It seemed brutal to leave the poor chap alone with the woman, so I went along. Right from the start, from the moment we stepped into the taxi, the feeling began to grow that something was about to break loose. A massive silence prevailed in the corner where the aunt sat, and though Rocky, balancing himself on the little seat in front, did his best to supply dialogue, we weren't a chatty party. I had a glimpse of Jeeves as we went into the flat, sitting in his lair, and I wished I could have called to him to rally round. Something told me that I was about to need him. The stuff was on the table in the sitting-room. Rocky took up the decanter. "'Say when, Bertie. Stop!' barked the aunt, and he dropped it. I caught Rocky's eye as he stooped to pick up the ruins. It was the eye of one who sees it coming. "'Leave it there, Rock Mettler, said Aunt Isabel, and Rocky left it there. "'The time has come to speak,' she said. "'I cannot stand idly by and see a young man going to perdition.' Poor old Rocky gave a sort of gurgle, a kind of sound rather like the whiskey had made running out of the decanter onto my carpet. Eh? he said, blinking. The aunt proceeded. The fault, she said, was mine. I had not seen then the light, but now my eyes are open. I see the hideous mistake I have made. I shudder at the thought of the wrong I did you, Rock Mettler by urging you into contact with this wicked city. I saw Rocky grope feebly for the table. His fingers touched it, and a look of relief came into the poor chappie's face. I understood his feelings. But when I wrote you that letter, Rock Mettler, instructing you to go to the city and live its life, I had not had the privilege of hearing Mr. Mundy speak on the subject of New York. Jimmy Mundy, I cried. You know how it is sometimes when everything seems all mixed up and you suddenly get a clue. When she mentioned Jimmy Mundy, I began to understand more or less what had happened. I had seen it happen before. I remember, back in England, a man I had met before Jeeves sneaked off to a meeting on his evening out and came back and denounced me in front of a crowd of chappies I was giving a bit of supper to as a moral leper. The aunt gave me a withering up and down. Yes, Jimmy Mundy, she said. I am surprised at a man of your stamp having heard of him. There is no music, there are no drunken dancing men, no shameless flaunting women at his meetings. So for you they would have no attraction. But for others, less dead in sin, he has his message. He has come to save New York from itself, to force it, in his picturesque phrase, to hit the trail. It was three days ago, Rock Mettler, that I first heard of him. It was accident that took me to his meeting. How often in this life a mere accident may shape our whole future. 
You had been called away by the telephone message from Mr. Belasco, so you could not take me to the Hippodrome, as we had arranged. I asked your manservant, Jeeves, to take me there. The man has very little intelligence. He seems to have misunderstood me. I am thankful that he did. He took me to what I subsequently learned was Madison Square Garden, where Mr. Mundy is holding his meetings. He escorted me to a seat and then left me, and it was not till the meeting had begun that I discovered the mistake which had been made. My seat was in the middle of a row. I could not leave without inconveniencing a great many people, so I remained. She gulped. Rock Mettler? I have never been so thankful for anything else. Mr. Mundy was wonderful. He was like some prophet of old, scourging the sins of the people. He leaped about in a frenzy of inspiration, till I feared he would do himself an injury. Sometimes he expressed himself in a somewhat odd manner, but every word carried conviction. He showed me New York in its true colors. He showed me the vanity and wickedness of sitting in gilded haunts of vice, eating lobster, when decent people should be in bed. He said that the tango and the foxtrot were devices of the devil to drag people down into the bottomless pit. He said that there was more sin in ten minutes with a negro banjo orchestra than in all the ancient revels of Nineveh and Babylon. And when he stood on one leg and pointed right at where I was sitting and shouted, This means you, I could have sunk through the floor. I came away a changed woman. Surely you must have noticed the change in me, Rockmettler. You must have seen that I was no longer the careless, thoughtless person who had urged you to dance in those places of wickedness. Rocky was holding on to the table as if it was his only friend. Y yes, he stammered. I, I thought something was wrong. Wrong? Something was right. Everything was right. Rock Mettler, it is not too late for you to be saved. You have only sipped of the evil cup. You have not drained it. It will be hard at first but you will find that you can do it if you fight with a stout heart against the glamour and fascination of this dreadful city. Won't you, for my sake, try, Rock Mettler? Won't you go back to the country tomorrow and begin the struggle, little by little, if you use your will? I can't help thinking it must have been the word will that roused dear old Rocky like a trumpet call. It must have brought home to him the realisation that a miracle had come off and saved him from being cut out of Aunt Isabel's. At any rate, as she said it, he perked up, let go of the table, and faced her with gleaming eyes. Do you want me to go back to the country, Aunt Isabel? Yes. Not to live in the country? Yes, Rock Mettler. Stay in the country? All the time, you mean? Never come to New York? Yes, Rock Mettler. I mean just that. It is the only way. Only there can you be safe from temptation. Will you do it, Rock Mettler? Will you, for my sake? Rocky grabbed the table again. He seemed to draw a lot of encouragement from that table. I will, he said. Jeeves, I said. It was next day, and I was back at the old flat, lying in the old armchair, with my feet upon the good old table. I had just come from seeing dear old Rocky off to his country cottage, and an hour before he had seen his aunt off to whatever hamlet it was that she was the curse of, so we were alone at last. Jeeves, there's no place like home. What? Very true, sir. The jolly old roof tree and all that sort of thing, what? Precisely, sir. I lit another cigarette. Jeeves, sir, do you know... At one point in the business, I really thought you were baffled. Indeed, sir. When did you get the idea of taking Miss Rockmettler to the meeting? It was pure genius. Thank you, sir. It came to me a little suddenly, one morning when I was thinking of my aunt, sir. Your aunt? The handsome cab one? Yes, sir. I recollected that whenever we observed one of her attacks coming on, we used to send for the clergyman of the parish. We always found that if he talked to her a while of higher things, it diverted her mind from handsome cabs. It occurred to me that the same treatment might prove efficacious in the case of Miss Rockmettler. 
I was stunned by the man's resource. It's brain, I said. Pure brain. What do you do to get like that, Jeeves? I believe you must eat a lot of fish or something. Do you eat a lot of fish, Jeeves? No, sir. Oh, well, then it's just a gift, I take it. And if you aren't born that way, there's no use worrying. Precisely, sir, said Jeeves. If I might make this suggestion, sir, I should not continue to wear your present tie. The green shade gives you a slightly bilious air. I should strongly advocate the blue with the red domino pattern instead, sir. All right, Jeeves, I said humbly. You know. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Ant and the Sluggard by P.G. Woodhouse. If you've enjoyed this episode, you may also enjoy Carry On Jeeves, another series of short stories by P.G. Woodhouse, available for free in your podcast feed. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. Thank you.